Welcome to Close Listening, Art International Radio's program of readings and conversations with poets presented in collaboration with Penn Sound. Today's show is being broadcast live from the Arts Cafe of the Kelly Writers House of the University of Pennsylvania. My guest today for the second of two shows is Arkady Dragomoshenko. My name is Charles Bernstein. On today's show, Penn students will join me in conversation with Arkady Dragomoshenko. Arkady Dragomoshenko's Xenia was published in 1994 in Russian and English, again by Sun and Moon Press. Other books of poetry followed under suspicion in the English translation and his selected poems in 2000. Dragomoshenko has published several books of fiction and prose, including Phosphor, Chinese Sun, published in New York by Ugly Duckling Press, a book called Indifference, and a book of collected prose, which is a book of collected prose. Dalkey Archives Press has published his most recent book, Dust in 2009. He lives in Petersburg where he teaches, writes for the newspaper, and muses about the state of things real and unreal. Arkady, welcome back to Close Listening. You can't imagine how I'm happy now. <laughs> so our first uh, Questions will be from Valeria and June, bilingually. Yes, uh, thank you very much for being here. Спасибо большое. Uh, I'm going to read the first question in Russian, and June. No, no, you can read it in English. It's enough for me, but uh, probably you will help me when uh, answer okay. this question. Right, yeah, it's not a very simple we can just question. Read them in, in English then. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, we notice a strong sense of loss in your work, especially in your book titled Dust. A, a feeling of the fleeting nature of experience and memory and of things that we are not permitted to retain. If language can't contain or remember lived experiences in its entirety, what do you see it as able to do instead? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's not a bad question, but this is a very simple answer because when you write, when you write poetry, especially poetry, you see you are face to face with the process of losing the meaning and exchanging the meaning. So you, every time, every minute, every moment, let's say, a moment, you see how the meaning lose its actuality and transforms completely another thing, you know, in another way. So the key word is loss, yes, for this. Because of do you remember the uh, Luria, Kabbalah, uh, and so on? The conception of creative of universe. Uh, Luria said that uh, God was God was more than universe, but to create universe, he had to reduce himself. So this is a process of losing of yourself. Yes. So to creating something, it is to lose something. To add something, it is the same process of losing of something. Uh, so just to follow up with that, when, when you write, um, do you think about the process of writing as the process of losing your identity or losing, um, do, you, do you know what I'm saying? No, no. <laughs> I am thinking about money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> no, no. no. You know, I, 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 uh, you're thinking about it without getting it, though. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I just recalled that the, uh, my wife, she said, Arkady, for what you write so long pieces, you know, just put it in the parts, and the, it will be much more easier to negotiate with your publisher. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, just the next question. Could you, <laughs> could you speak about the relationship between memory and experience in your poetry, especially in your books Dust and Chinese Sun, uh, which seem to us to, to be the most autobiographically evocative of your works? Do you see memory as working uh, upon experience in any way? Uh, first of all, I, uh, you know, I'm tell the truth. I really forgot about these books. <laughs> Yes, but I think that uh, there was there a second part of this question. I like it because you say uh, you asked me about the e memory and experience, but uh, when we speak about these two main, you know, things, bearings, I think you have to say about imagination, put it in the middle between memory and experience. 
So this is a endless play between memory and imagination because the imagination is a resource of the memory and the memory can be just only when the imagination works and create the possibility to to recall something uh, can you imagine the child who put his hand on a stove it's very painful yes and then he see these uh, surfaces and try to he imagine if he put on the same stove uh, like this thing like this the stove the, his hand he got a pain so he, the memory starts work in his imagine in his uh, mind through the imagination you know and this is two main things to create your experience from one side, the memory, which asks about the work of the imagination. From the other side, the imagination who are looking for fixing itself in the memory. And this is experience. I think so. Um, which kind of goes along with our next question. Um, in the title of your book, Description, are you alluding in any way to a realist tradition? And can you speak about what it is that you're actually describing and how? Description. I told my students that uh, all your uh, act of writing is the same way simultaneously, the act of reception. Every saying is a form of reception. So when you describe something, you, to some extent, you create the position of the thing and this thing in the whole, you know. Because the uh, uh, writing description is form of perceiving. So it is not description of, uh, you know, the way or direction to the next corner. Description is the constructing and there's a process of you know, creating of the form more wide, probably, uh, I, don't, I don't know who, how can do it, uh, this, let us say, antenne of reception. Uh, and also about your book description, um, if, as you say in, in your poems in this book, that language is always incomplete and can't live up to enormous dreams or promises, uh, could you talk a little bit about what you feel that you can be responsible toward um, when you talk about responsibility in your writing? You have to know this uh, really wonderful explanation of uh, sublime in Immanuel Kant. He said there exist two possibilities of knowledge. The things you can imagine or things you can uh, present... Uh, no, the things you can think about which you can think and things which you can imagine. So uh, there is uh, the word of simplicity. Yes, what is it? What is it? Can you imagine simplicity? Can you have, uh, you know, uh, an image of simplicity? It always, every time, it needs more and more dividing in more and more parts, yeah? But you can, you know, imagine the table because the tableness in your head is an idea, a platonic idea, you know. So, let us go f far. Remind me, please, your question. <laughs> the, the question was, um, if language is an in, in incomplete so, okay, way... Okay, okay. So, in this way, we can speak about the incompleteness of language, the language went... Uh, because it... Uh, the language is, uh, you know, it's a very strange creature. It's like we, us, you know, it's every time uh, feel incomplete and incompleteness, uh, недостаточность. Uh, not enough. Not enough, not enough, not enough, exactly. Not, yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you see the language of, you know, books, uh, tales, but it demands more and more. Because it is not only you, but it is not only your uh, you know, part of you, because it is slightly before you. Uh, so could you, could you talk about, back to the, the question of um, what does authorly responsibility mean to you when you write about... Uh, at the Hearing. Hear 
and answering and answering, response. hearing and answering, you know. We lost, you know, the fat cat of so-called tradition stole the reality, mm. stole the reality. They, uh, they, you know, they killed the uh, possibility to hear the world, to hear in the world. And the responsibility is at the same time hearing and answering to the world. So how does this idea of responsibility relate to translation? Do you feel responsible for what your books in translation say, and do you recognize these poems as I don't yours? care. I don't care. But I like to work with the translator, because in some time we do, both of us, we do completely new things. Mm -hmm. So when you hear the poems, do they? Yeah, right, right. When I hear the first, probably, drafts of the work of translator, I, you know, I steal something for myself and exchange my work, you know, because sometimes it's better than I. Yeah. Dragomoshenko says that he's very concerned about translation. He pays a great deal of attention to it, tries to control everything that's in the other language <laughs> and feels that the translator has a parasitic relationship to his original. <laughs> And could, could you speak a little bit about the relation between your poetry and, po and your poetics? Um, from a lot of your poetry, we get the sense that there's a, a mixture in there of um, your own experiences with also with statements of your poetics. And could you talk about why these things might coexist in your poetry? I think there's a no, uh, you know, bright uh, you know, uh, line between poetics and poetry. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the poetry is a, a self-reflection, uh, you know, uh, system. Mm -hmm. Every time the poetry which you write asks itself why I am existing on a page. So you need to uh, explain to this page why you write it, you know. So this is the uh, first step to the theory. Why? For what? So this is uh, poetry and poetic probably sometimes is the same. In Charles Bernstein's great poem, the... Uh, um, absorption and uh, yes, yes, yeah, artifice and absorption. It's a great poem. To some extent, they s think that this is a, you know, the theory tractus work. Lucrezi, do you remember uh, Lucrezi? His Lucretius, the nature Lucretius, of things. Lucretius, yes, actually. Lucretius, yeah. This is the same. So, kind of a random question. But uh, do you feel a connection to Germany or to any German literary tradition having been born there? You know, sometimes I think they, this, I was, uh, I was a, a baby, you know, and I think that uh, probably some things move me and I try to find the roots of these impulses. And uh, I probably, we talk with Nick Fiambina in, uh, New York many years ago in Segi Foundation about the kids of uh, parents who are, you know, spent the time in the war, Second War, they have special kind of recollections, very weak, very transparent, but they they exist. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, slipping out of the, uh, articulation possible to come, but I think to some extent it's... So it, Nick uh, was a, a a military brat, as we say, yeah. in the United States, and was in Germany as a yeah, son right. of as a me. military officer yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in Potsdam. And that was your reason as well. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Lily, and I'm going to ask you two questions. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so my first question is, in... Your poem, Observation of a Fallen Leaf as the Ultimate Basis of Landscape, you describe rust corroding hierarchies and connect this with the avarice of form. And I saw a connection between this and something you say in an essay called On the Superfluous, published in Boundary 2, which is that synesthesia is the forgetfulness of any definition. Yeah. And I was hoping if you could talk about the role of form in your poetry and how f your use of form relates to your concept of synesthesia. I think uh, the synesthesia, as you say, because I have a completely another pronunciation in Russian, synesthesia, synesthesia. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, um, it is, ha, it is right. <laughs> uh, firstly, here is the real pronunciation <laughs> in English. 
Yeah, uh, I think I uh, think that it is a great uh, the synesthesia is just a uh, promise the journey, but never you know you you get it from <laughs> it. <laughs> We're talking with Arkady Dragomoshenko on Penn Sounds, close listening on Art International Radio, operating at artonair.org. Yeah. Um, okay, all right, so I guess then my other question, um, maybe you've already answered it, but it's a question about translation, but more specifically relating to sound. Um, I was wondering if as a poet who considers sound and language so often and so often together, if you worry about when translating... No, completely not. Okay. Don't worry, don't worry. Absolutely don't okay. worry. Because you... Can you imagine the language consists from sh sh uh, consonants and they try to translate the poem. I like these sounds, why not? <laughs> it is not a work of a translator to copy the sound pattern of the poem, you know. Right, well that was part of, going to be part of my question is that English and Russian obviously have very different sound profiles and you know, we as English speakers and readers are coming at your poetry with a whole different... It is, I, I think this is much uh, uh, Russian and English to some extent, you can't believe me, but they are more close than French and Russian. Mm. But it is, it is hard to compare probably the Finnish of, uh, language with Russian. It is so... S -s language but mm. I like I like as is a sacral sound in mm. Greece language ancient Greece language so I'm not sure that we need to copy or just to pretend to recreate the same sound pattern because every language have its own unconsciousness of sound in mm. itself you know so it must cover it this you know just uh, they I think they uh, Original in this work is just motivation to write a new poem. Mm. But, you know, if they speak about wine, don't write about please water. You know? Right. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> Hi. I have another question about translation. Um, could you speak about the planar and axial understanding of language that you mention in regards to the Tower of Babel? Yeah, and I remember. <laughs> you don't remember? I remember, yeah. Uh, does the axial model leave room for the authority of the original text? I remember that I spoke uh, 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 about it, but I don't remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> you describe language as um, <laughs> swirling around an axis, yeah, coming yeah. in and out of existence. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could speak about that idea. I like it. <laughs> As if you're hearing it for the first I, time I li today. I like to, to invent something. No, 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 I don't know. Well, uh, I, I, the idea probably was that they try to, uh, you know, describe the uh, Babylon Tower as something static and the whole sit uh, situation around dynamic. And I think that the language is dynamic, so I try to put in outside this uh, uh, Babel Tower and put it in surrounding and the, let us say, languages and understanding language as motionless, uh, you know, situations. So I think that I've just uh, switched the places between dynamic circling vortex uh, of uh, uh, you know, nations, ethnics, and so on and so forth, around the God language, you know, and put the language as uh, exchange itself every moment around the uh, very static uh, humankind, you know? I think so. But I don't know, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, um, my next question is, how does the statement everything is happening now factor into descriptions of past and future in your work? But, you know, uh, uh, this is my just, just my uh, feeling uh, uh, about myself because, uh, yes, I, I uh, you know, I spent time in a school, I, I know what history means, I know what the chronology means, but all things happen at the same time in my head, you know. <laughs> you said me the uh, the Rome Empire of Rome is the same as 
there's a, a glass of water now because or no or you forget it because uh, there is an oh, there is a, I think that we live a completely different situation non linear or you know situation of understanding the past and the future we live in a situation of you know this blissful uh, example of have you a pen have your page your page not mine, please. <laughs> <laughs> Not mine. So we say this is beginning and this is end. End or future end and this is beginning, the start. Start. So there is the arrow of the time, yes? From the past to the, the future. <laughs> so where you find beginning and the, uh, the, uh, and the you know, the end? Here, if you, you know, explicate this page of paper, you can see this, you see this, all the things became in completely different pattern. It is not line. It's many line, countless line, you know, and they form completely different, you know, pattern of our perception of time. A visual translation, Arkady Dragomoshenko wrote, uh, did it st drew a straight line with beginning and end on it and then crumpled the paper. <laughs> okay, and this is also related. Um, in Dust, you write, I don't know what will happen tomorrow, but I'm positive about what didn't happen yesterday. What does this mean and how is this perhaps a statement of your poetics? This is a hope. This, I created the gap, you know, the break between uh, uh, desire to understanding and impossibility to understanding. You know, this is a. I just try to create this uh, fracture. Yeah, rupture. Rapture. 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 This rapture, when you stop your imagination, stop your experience, and you stay for a while because nothing uh, you can get. Any, any sense in this sentence, you know? Could this you? Destro I'm destroying the, your uh, evading, you know? Does this, though, have something to do with your everyday life, specifically in Petersburg now, and a sense of perhaps uh, economic no, uh, I am uh, unpredictability, you know, yeah. or social unpredictability. Yes, you know, because we live in a very strange society. Every time you you feel that in morning you see completely different. Uh, just a moment. You could say it in Russian. Shita, которые приходят тебе, ну, оплату. Bills, the bills, bills. You, uh, you, you bills is a good word not to remember how to say. About morning new bills, you know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi, my name is James. Um, my first question is, uh, in Memory Gardens, a memorial piece for Robert Creeley, you write, I evidently was unable to understand where in the matter of his poems there were rupture flashes, those invisible points of transformation and accretion that undoubtedly should have been there, creating conceptual knots of multi-vectored radiation. Um, so my question is, do you seek to create your own uh, rupture flashes in your poems? No. Beca no, no, I do it, but in a completely different way, because the breeze of English uh, language, I, I, I can say it because I heard even now the translations uh, which uh, Charles read, and this completely different system, you know, system of system of Prigrad. Obstacles, yeah, obstacles, yes, obstacles in the pronunciation. Yeah. Obstacles in being able to figure out what the word would be. Yes. <laughs> yeah, let us start from this, let us cl clarify the language. So we'll accomplish our conversation probably morning. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I guess then a follow-up question uh, would be, in regards to works like Neighbor, a collaboration with Lynn Hygienian, would you speak to any clash or intersection of ideologies you've encountered between the American and the Russian and how that intersection illuminates your work? Yes, you know, uh, what you mean when you say ideology? Let us say in a couple of words. The ideology is a set of uh, prescriptions, theory bearings, and uh, uh, direct, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. okay, you could get advices for a certain uh, social group. So uh, when we speak about the ideology, we don't speak about ideology of Protestants or Orthodoxy or Muslim, but speak about the machine which permit the certain group of people to rule uh, and you know to uh, deal with a more wide group and to, uh, about appropriation of this group by this uh, ideology hate any argumentation uh, ideology hate all things which uh, have alternative sense or meaning so uh, for what to speak about it mm -hmm. it is very clear and it is you understand Mm -hmm. When you have just only one way, so this is ideology. Mm -hmm. Start to work with your mind. Because the ideology uh, uh, offer you, this is the best. It is like, you know, a, a commercial. This is the best thing. It is ideology. It is an ideology machine. It works with your mind. No others, just only this way. So... I, I, I don't see any reason to speak with somebody about this. Um, well, then my last question would be, uh, going back to Creeley, he writes, form is never more than an extension of content. Uh, would you um, talk about your particular meshing of modes of writing, specifically in your prose collection, Dust? You, you, th you ask me about his, uh, his expression. Uh, his, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, even, uh, but this is an uh, extension of our formalist understanding the uh, so-called the structure of uh, literature, uh, uh, literature piece, or you know, uh, creation, uh, you know, work. Uh, there is no uh, content. There is a matter, and there is a form. And the form is as a, uh, and the form consists from desire to form this unformed stuff, desire, unconsciousness, recollection, and so on and so forth. And you do it and because uh, all, all of them are expressed itself in language. The unconsciousness is a language, it's not me. It's, uh, Lacan said about the throat. And the form is just only possibility to, to offer the special, uh, uh, you know, special kind of relation between different parts of possible, possible uh, differences, because a form is the same, the difference and coincidence. So I think that he was right, and I agree with him, because there is no, not about this, uh, what, what, I, uh, what I read about the, in this story, what about, I don't know. They say he, with the, with this guy who killed another guy, and in result, we have a rain, after, uh, you know, uh, outdoors. So you say, what about this story, about rain, about killing, about uh, boys, and who them, and so on, so on. This is nothing, it is not a content. The content is the so-called ethos of uh, war. To some extent, I think so. Thank you. You've been listening to Arkady Dragomashenko on Close Listening. The program was recorded on November 3rd, 2010 at the Arts Cafe at the Kelly Writers House at the University of Pennsylvania. Close Listening is a production of Penn Sound in collaboration with Art International Radio operating at artonair.org. For, for more information on this show, including the video feed, visit our website, writing.upenn.edu slash pensound. I'm Charles Bernstein, looking for the space between memory, imagination, and description that makes for the ethos of close listening. Thank you. Thank you.